Tonight we welcome Matt Pales, uh, presently an assistant professor of anthropology at his undergraduate alma mater, the University of Oklahoma. Matt received his PhD from the University of Arizona in 2015, where his work centered on Eastern Sonora. He has also conducted, I guess it was his MA research at Sierra Prieto, just north of Tucson. While at the U of A, he served as the, on the board of directors of Arc and Hiss as a student representative. In addition to his work in Sonora, he has ongoing projects on the northern plains of North America. Tonight, Matt will share his work in eastern Sonora, which was the basis of his dissertation, as well as his almost off the press book. And to the follow up on John's comments, uh, Matt was one of the first awardees of another award we give out each year, which is the Subvention Award to help people with the publication costs of volumes like this. So he received a 2015 Subvention Award for this volume. Um, so thank you. He's made a very quick trip out from Oklahoma today. He's going, came out an hour, two hours ago, and he's going home in the morning. So we really appreciate that. Uh, please welcome Matt Pales. <laughs> There we go. Well, actually, I should thank you for having me out here, and um, definitely thank you to the AHS members for providing things like this Invention Fund, which made it possible for me to, in fact, publish my dissertation, which is definitely exciting. So, as you see tonight, I'm going to talk to you about archaeology in eastern Sonora. Um, but before I kind of launch into the details of what I did down there in eastern Sonora, it's uh, good to take a step back here and talk about why is this region potentially important? Why do we care about this? Why did I go down there to do research in the first place? So as I imagine many of you know, um, no doubt so there's quite a few presentations on the Southwest, and there's a rather perennial thing that many of us work on, which is this big question of uh, where did a lot of the stuff, a lot of the ideas that we see that really impacted people's lives in the greater Southwest. There's this idea that maybe some of that came from Mesoamerica. So some of those big state level things down there in central Mexico, places like the Aztec, the Toltecs, the Mayas, right? Now, we can look at these things in the Southwest, and there's a variety of different materials where we can actually demonstrate that, yes, definitely, these things came from Mesoamerica. So we have things like scarlet cause, and we have things like cacao, or chocolate, and um, chocolate candy, things where we can demonstrate the materials were actually moving from Mesoamerica up to the southwest. But there's only a handful of these things, and it's really hard to know how much weight we should give to those things, right? Does this imply that Mesoamericans were really kind of involved in the southwest, or was this just some kind of peripheral interaction? So a kind of much bigger question is, did folks in the southwest, did they get their ideas for how to kind of organize a society? Did they get their ideas about inequality? Did they get their ideas about religion? Did they get their ideas about um, who should be in charge in society? Did those things come from Mesoamerica? Well, it's a very natural question. That if you're going to ask those questions about the Southwest, to think, well, maybe a real important place in this discussion should be Northwest Mexico. Obviously, it's about halfway between Mesoamerica and the U.S. Southwest. But surprisingly, we have done very little actual archaeological work there, right? So it's actually a very hard question to get at. So my research, one of the big things I was going at was trying to at least begin to approach this question, kind of go and fill in some of those archaeological gaps about this region to try and understand how these kind of continental scale stories may have played out, right? Now, I say there hasn't been much work done in there, but that doesn't mean we don't know anything at all about this region. And for a long time, I would say the last 50, 60 ish years or so, the kind of dominant place that we got information about what was going on in this part of the world, meaning kind of what at the time was the kind of northern frontier of Spain, northwest Mexico today, Sonora Chihuahua, was that there were a number of very early explorers who passed through this region, starting in the 1530s with um, Cabeza de Vaca, eventually going through to some guys who were kind of more well-known, people like Francisco de Coronado, like I have in this picture here. And there were four or five of these folks who all passed through what is today eastern Sonora in the 1500s, right? So this was kind of right after you know, contact, right? This is very early. And they gave us a couple of pages of description each. The kind of longest one of these narratives is about a dozen or so pages to describe what's going on in this region. And for a long time, we've basically used only this information to kind of reconstruct, to kind of fill this archaeological gap 
of what we think was going on in this region. But of course, it's a big question of, well, is what was going on there in 1530? Is that what they told us anything about what was going on there back in 1450, right? It gives us a place to start, but it doesn't really tell us everything we want to know. So based on these early narratives, some ethno historians came up with some pretty elaborate reconstructions, right? And they came up with basically exactly what you'd expect if Northwest Mexico was in fact kind of filling this gap between Mesoamerica and the United States Southwest. You know, they envisioned things going on here that were basically half Mesoamerican and half United States Southwest. So just some of the high points of the things they kind of distilled from these texts, things that Coronado said, things that Cabeza de Vaca said. They said that there was probably an extremely high population density in this region, upwards of 100,000 people. So keep in mind, um, in relative terms, many demographers of the U.S. Southwest think that there were maybe only 100,000 people in the U.S. Southwest at pretty near peak population. So 100,000 people, that's a lot of people to propose running around eastern Sonora at this time period. All right? They also said they thought these people were organized into these things they called statements, right? So this is an idea that basically says, well, it's not exactly what was going on in the rest of the U.S. Southwest. It's kind of something more than that, but it's also not really like Mesoamerica Aztec style people, right? It's kind of halfway in between again. Fill us this gap, much like you would expect it would. And they said, well, the reason why we think these people are organized in this way here is because these Mesoamericans are coming up and they're influencing them. And they're really involved and trying to move these kind of Mesoamerican goods up to the Southwest, and presumably also move goods from the Southwest down to Mesoamerica. And that kind of gives these elite people in this region kind of something they can work with, right? It gives them a basis, have a lot of inequality, something they can kind of control the local people with. And they build these big, expansive polities, right? So the basic argument is that we have a lot of warfare going on here because we have people competing over these different trade networks. You have a lot of fancy stuff moving through here. Things like scarlet cause, cacao, and presumably things like turquoise going the other way down to Mesoamerica, all right? Well, just on first principles, there's kind of some problems with this story, right? If you actually go to Eastern Sonora, it's kind of hard to imagine how that law should be applied to this landscape. So here's a picture I took standing in the Bibi's Pay Valley. So, I'll mention this valley again, but basically it's the easternmost valley in Sonora, right? So I'm standing up here on the mountains, and it's actually the rainy season, so you look at this and you probably think, ah, oh, it's really nice and lush and green, but you know, a couple weeks before it would have been nasty and brown, and a couple weeks later it'll pretty much go back to being pretty ugly and brown. It's actually really hot and really dry here for much of the year. And the only place that you can actually do a lot of agriculture, which is something you're gonna need to do if you're gonna fit a lot of people on this landscape, is in this little sliver of river around here. You can see and it wraps around there. And this is actually a pretty sizable river valley. This is about as big as it gets. But in actuality, it's only a couple hundred yards, a couple hundred meters wide, a couple kilometers long. So it's actually a very small percentage of the landscape that you can actually do this kind of intentions of agriculture, which is what you're going to need to do to fit all these new people on the landscape. So just to kind of quantify that for you, Here's a topographic map, and I didn't realize this looks like, for the most part, just a bunch of jumbled lines. But I went and I filled in there all the spaces where I think you could actually do agriculture, right? So the places on the landscape where you're actually going to be able to produce a lot of food. And you can look at this map and see, well, that's actually not very much of this landscape. So it's actually going to be pretty hard to imagine how 100,000 people are going to make a living off this landscape. Something else that's quite important. You can see that those little green patches there, they're pretty spread out. They're not all in one big clump, right? So this is going to encourage you to kind of have a lot of independent groups on this landscape. It's going to be really hard to form those big, large, territorial, state-like type things that those ethnic historians thought existed in this region. It just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But this is certainly not something that I can work with all on my own. People have kind of criticized this model for many decades, but there's been very little actual archaeological work to go down and actually try to rectify these observations, right? We can make these observations just looking at satellite imagery. We have this model from the ethnic historians to say, no, no, there are really complex things going on here, right? So my basic questions were, let's go do some archaeology in this region. I certainly wasn't the first person to do archaeology in this region. There wasn't very much. And let's ask some very basic questions, okay? So what was the scale of political cooperation 
customers? What were the biggest groups that we have out there, right? And we have these big, huge, expansive communities. We have things that look kind of Mesoamerican-esque. Or do we have things that look more like what we'd expect if these were just more Southwestern-style groups, right? So one way to phrase this is, what is the largest cooperative group? And by cooperation, we mean at what scale do people cooperate in terms of doing farming, of sharing food, of coordinating together to do things like the fence, and also at what scale do people actually interact in terms of trade? You know, who do they regularly interact with? Okay? And whatever scale these people work, organize that, we can also ask questions about, well, how are they held together? What unified them? Was it really all about trade or exchange? Like people have always said in the past? Or do we see other things? You know, how broadly is ideology shared? Can we say anything about warfare alliances? Okay? So we're going to look at this in kind of two stages. The first, I'm going to just ask this very basic question. How big were the groups? And then we'll kind of look at some of these other questions. What held these groups together? But before I launch into that, it's useful to say something about what are the baselines of comparison? So we're going to do a quick tour of some regions that no doubt you've probably heard a few things about if you come to these lectures regularly. And we'll talk about what's going on more or less at the same time over here in Casas Grandes, up here in the whole Kong, and over at your chairs. So the region we're really talking about is Rio Sonora, where we're going to go and visit all of the neighbors to just kind of set a bit of a historical context for the time period we're looking at. Okay? So we'll start over to the east in Casas Grandes. So over in Casas Grandes, we have one giant massive site by the name of Packy Bay. I imagine most of you have probably heard of Packy Bay, all right? So at this time period, more or less, we're talking about, about 1200 to 1450 AD. Things definitely go a little bit later in Sonora, as I'll talk about here in a moment. But Packy Bay, that's really the peak, right? And there's thousands of people who live at this site. Archaeologists like to argue a lot about just how big Packy Bay was. You have some who say maybe it's only 1,000 people. We have other people who say maybe it's upwards of several thousand all the way up to 5,000 people. Either way, it's undeniably a huge place massive amounts of labor going in, and tons and tons of exotic items there. So I have this kind of artistic depiction of a guy hit with a macaw. These are actually pens over here for raising scarlet macaws. This was done on the site. We also have lots of kind of fine um, crafts. So here we have some nice ceramics. And importantly, on many of these ceramics, and many of these artistic traditions, we see styles that very clearly are Mesoamerican inspired. Right? So this fits into this narrative, Mesoamerica kind of sticking its fingers up there in the youth as Southwest and really influencing things. Right? People argue about well, just how much did that occur, and it's an even bigger question of was Pepin special, was this a kind of one-off situation, or is this a model that we can export to many places in the U.S. Southwest. Right? Now notably, Pekin Bay is kind of a singular exception in this region. There aren't very many other impressive population centers in this part of Northwest Mexico. So now we're going to shift gears. Very briefly to talk about the Hohokam. No doubt everybody in this room has probably sat through quite a few Hohokam lectures, so I probably don't need to tell you much about it. But just as a quick refresher, in this time period, which we refer to as the late classic, maybe kind of going into the early classics, starting at about 1100 or so, and going up to about 1450 or so, we get a system of organization that tends to be pretty dependent on what the local ecological conditions are. So places like the Phoenix Basin, where you can do lots of irrigation, you tend to get these very big centers, and they have things like platform mounds, and they also have a lot of fine crafts. <coughs> very clearly, this is a society like Akime, where you have a very clear status hierarchy. There are haves and have-nots in terms of material possessions. There are people who have political power, people who have ideological power. Nobody's going to mistake either of these societies for being egalitarian, right? There's very clear rankings in society. And we get places like Casa Brand, this big, huge, <coughs> huge in a lot of sense, four stories tall structure, it's probably some kind of chief's house. And you get a lot of these along canals in the Phoenix Basin. You also have some here in the Tucson Basin, far fewer because you kind of have a different ecological system. They tend to be more expensive. But very clearly, you have a lot of population with some very clear rulers in society. Okay? And then lastly, we'll go over to the west. Again, this is probably a pretty quick review. I know a lot of you have probably had Brandon Guire or Mr. Del Pondo talk about these places. But again, we have a very impressive center. So it's kind of something more in that model of Casas Grandes, where you kind of have the one big, huge center, and it kind of sucks in all the interaction from all the surrounding regions. 
So in the church Harris, we did have this one big site where people went and built hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of um, meters of terraces, right? You can see these terraces from kilometers away. So it's a very overt political statement about look at us, we've come together, we've made this communal investment, and we've built this very large, massive site that makes this statement, right? And there's some interesting architectural layouts. Um, folks like Brendan McGuire have argued that the kind of upper edge, the top levels of the site are occupied by elites who have special access to many fancy goods, things like shell, and probably even ceramics from over a packing bag. Now, almost certainly, there's some kind of hilltop focused ideology that's holding this community together. And we see that it's actually exported kind of all around from this big center out to the hinterland. So you get these small little zero stage chairs. Obviously, everybody's still kind of participating in the same very broad ideological tradition, but you have the one kind of behemoth site that's really controlling things. Interestingly, you actually get some of these sites, they creep their way all the way up into the Tucson Basin, which is where I did my master's degree of those sites. All right, so that's kind of the regional context, right? These are the kind of baselines. So these are the folks that if Eastern Sonora, like its previous models have suggested, are kind of like half mesoamerican esque we should expect Eastern Sonora to look even more impressive than these places, right? So this is kind of the baseline for what we should expect, okay? Now just one other quick side note here. At this time period, from about 1200 to 1450, it's pretty rough times in much of the U.S. Southwest. You have some places like Pacume that spring up during this time period that really kind of become the dominant place. Same thing over there with Cheris, the Hocom, they kind of go through some big changes. But after about 1450, all three of these places, they go into a pretty steep demographic decline. All right, you can kind of see, as we march through time here, these are just um, contours of population density. And you can see they're around 1450 or so, you basically have nobody left. Everybody's only over in the Rio Grande, and that's the only place we really know that there are large populations left. One other place that we know there are large populations, it's not depicted on this map, is Eastern Sonora. Right, so they just didn't have the data, so they left it off this map here. Right? So it's a big question. Why did all of these people still live in Eastern Sonora? And typically, it's been interpreted that maybe Eastern Sonora was kind of the last best place. You, know, you had places like Pekinay, you had places like Contreras, you had places like Hong Kong. Somehow, Eastern Sonora managed to surpass them and survive a bit longer. Okay? So kind of picking together these big questions. How do we see Mesoamerican interaction? How is this place organized? How many people lived here? Are the basic questions I was going to try and answer. Okay? So, very quickly, I mentioned clearly that I was not the first person to go into archaeology. This is a big place. And we're talking about half of the state here, basically. So, at the time that I did my dissertation work, which was ended up, uh, wrapped up in around 2012 or so, at that time period, there had been more or less kind of five projects done in this half of the state in this particular time period, right? So mine was actually this blue dot right here, along the Rio Montezuma. And then there had been some others, one down here in Rio Yaki, um, a couple up here in the Rio Pudis Bay. I think John Carpenter's gonna come talk to you here in a couple months, and he'll talk about some research that he has going on in a place down here called the Rio Sao Repo, right? So there's been an uptick in research here lately. There's like three or four projects that are currently going on, so we're having a major kind of influx of new ideas and new data coming in. But at the time I did my dissertation, it was a pretty scant landscape in terms of what had previously been done. But there was one pretty impressive project that was done back in the 1970s, and that would be this yellow dot over here that was conducted over in the Rio Sonora. Right? And these archaeologists, they had the same basic questions that I did, right? They looked at these at the historic accounts and they said, well, let's see if we can go and verify some of these things. Let's see if we can go out and actually find these statements that these ethno-historians are telling us that they exist out here. So they went out to the Rio Sonora and they surveyed the entire valley, north to south, and they found two really big sites. And at two of these sites, they found things that they thought were ball courts, which are a kind of public architecture that are pretty common throughout the entire history of the U.S. Southwest. They showed up at Pacine, they showed up in the whole concrete earlier in time. And they said, well, we've got two sites, we've got two ball courts, they're kind of far apart from each other in this valley. We think these are the statements. We think this is the confirmation of what those ethnic historians were telling us should be here. But interestingly, you know, this is back, you know, 40, 50 years ago now, before we could do kind of quick comparisons with these maps. 
Nobody ever really got around to kind of overlaying the ethnohistorian reconstruction with the archaeological confirmation of this. So as it turns out, here are these two sites, and I actually think there's probably a third one up here. They didn't survey up here, but there will probably be another one of that about the same size up there. So we can see that we actually have something like probably three or four of these different communities that the archaeologists identified in the space that the ethnohistorian said there should only be one. So there's obviously a major kind of does not match scale situation going here. But nobody ever really addressed this, like I said. And so that was kind of one of the things I wanted to look at with my dissertation, was to say, well, there's obviously a disconnect here in the interpretations that have made for this region. OK. So what did I actually do? So here's just another kind of picture that gave you an idea of the city, right? So this is the Montezuma Valley. And pretty much all of the sites um, throughout this entire region this may not be true for earlier in time, but the time period we're talking about started about 1000 AD, going all the way to probably 1600 AD or so. Pretty much all the sites are only located up here along these bases. Very rarely do you get something out there on the floodplain, and even more rarely do you get something that's kind of far away from the river. Pretty much everybody is living on these bases right next to the river floodplains. And you can see these things are not huge, right? So I'm standing on one side, and you can see the other side right there. Right there is the very end of the valley that goes into a steep canyon. You can't do agriculture past that point. It only goes a kilometer or so to the other direction. We're looking south right here. So not a whole lot of good farmland, right? It's going to be hard to have a lot of people living on this landscape. Even though within these valleys, you can do a lot of good agriculture, but there's just not very much of this space out there, OK? Here's what those hills look like. Looks, like I said, again, looks really nice and lush and green. You think this is a really kind of nice tropical location, but it's because we're there in the rainy season. It certainly does not look like this the entire year. And I will tell you, every single one of those plants desperately wants to hurt you. They all have a thousand <laughs> plants on them, okay? So, what did we actually do? Okay, so we were down there for two different years. 2010, we went down and we did a survey. And we basically just repeated what those folks had done 30 years earlier over in the real store about picked out a good stretch of river valley, had a couple of these good broad floodplains on it, and we just walked up one side and walked down the other side for about 200 meters in on both sides, because we think this is pretty much where all these sites are. We did some other kind of more sporadic horseback type survey in some kind of more distant places, checked out some places some ranchers know about. But for the most part, we pretty much confirmed what everybody has always said, which is the sites are pretty much only right there along the river corridors. Okay? Well, after doing the survey, Went back two years later, 2012, we picked out the three largest sites that we found on the survey and we did excavation. So throughout the rest of this presentation, you'll hear me refer to the southern part of the survey, which is basically this big site of Olive Gal, because that's where we excavated down there, and Teo Nedeva up here in the north. As it turned out, this one here in the middle, Los Mineros, was not that impressive. So pretty much any time I talk about the south, you can kind of lump Los Mineros in with El Gal. Okay? So this is kind of what most of the architecture looks like down in this region. More often than not, what you find when you're doing a survey are just these little laminates, stones right here. These are usually only kind of small rooms off by themselves, about you know four or six yards on the side. Every now and then you get one that's kind of linked together with two or three others, but for the most part it's pretty spread out houses on the surface. When you do excavation, usually these things are only like about that deep. There's just not that much to them. Right? A lot of them probably were only made out of things like reeds and mats and other things that were completely perishable. Every now and then you get lucky, there's kind of a little bit more to the walls and it gets some nice adobe here. It gives you kind of some nice boundaries and a nice floor. But for the most part, most of the architecture is pretty flimsy. But it's really easy to see on the surface, except for where the cows have kicked all the rocks out of the place, which is unfortunately a pretty common thing. But this is basically what we're dealing with, okay? So, from going out and doing this survey, here's a map of all the sites that we found, or at least all the habitation sites we found. I left off some of the walk art and other special sites here. But these are all the sites we found along that river valley, right? And I've just kind of scaled them based on how big they were, right? So keep in mind the basic question I'm trying to answer here. The first basic question I'm trying to answer is, well, how many groups do we have in this little bit of river valley? Do we have one big integrated polity, or do we have a couple of independent groups? They really don't have much at all to do with each other living in this one river valley. Well, just looking at this map, you might say, well, it looks like pretty clearly 
there's at least two and maybe three groups, right? So that's kind of another way to phrase this question. We get this kind of natural break between these sites. Is that a real thing? Did people not really interact across that boundary? Or was this just kind of an artifact with the fact that the valley gets really narrow right there, you can't do much agriculture, so people didn't build sites, okay? But there's a couple of different ways archaeologists over the years have kind of built up um, comparative data sets to answer a question whether or not when you get the distribution of sites, you have this basic question of, well, are all these sites together or are all these sites kind of different sets of things that are kind of duplicated out there in the landscape? And one of the things we do is we just look at the distribution of the size of the sites. So we count up how many big sites we have, how many medium sites we have, how many little sites we have. And it kind of makes sense that if you have a couple of big sites, that probably implies those sites are independent. So one way we do this I realize this is an you know, general issue with these kind of XY graphs and these kind of talks, but here it is anyways. Sorry. So it's an important part of the story, so there's no way around it. But what we do is we just we bid them up, right? So we rank them largest to smallest, and then we measure their size, and we put them on a graph like this, and then we compare them to a straight line, right? So here's our imaginary straight line. We've transformed them mathematically, and then we kind of read these lines that are underneath them here mostly, kind of like an EDT leads. Okay, so when you get a pattern like this, so here's a comparative Pachyne Casas Grandis, where you get this giant fall off, and then a kind of funny pattern there, you get basically the same pattern over here in Chincheros. Almost always, that's the indication of a relationship where you have one big massive site, and it basically sucks up all the interaction from everybody else. So all those small sites, all those medium sites, the only thing they're doing is interacting with that big site. They don't really have anything to do with each other, right? So medium sites don't interact with other medium sites. Small sites interact with other small sites. They're only back and forth to that big site. Right? Another comparison is just an example, subset of the Hoakam, the Miranda community, which is basically the northern Tucson basin here. We can see that they actually follow pretty close to this line until they kind of trail off and do funny stuff there at the end. Almost always, what that indicates is a well-integrated economy. Right? So you have big sites interacting with the medium sites, big sites interacting with the small sites, but you also get the small sites interacting with each other, the medium sites interacting with each other. Okay? So this is kind of our comparison, right? These are the three places I described how things were kind of operating at the same time period. Now let's look at what's going on in this story, right? So these are four comparative sets. This is my research. This is that stuff from back in the 1970s, and then these are work from two other scholars who work in this region. And you can see they actually look quite different, right? So almost always, when you get kind of a convex pattern like this, what this certainly means is that we've actually managed to capture kind of two copies of one of those own patterns within our sample. In other words, we've got multiple copies of some kind of other system going on here, right? Now keep in mind, we're talking about pretty small slices of the actual landscape. So basically, 30 kilometers or so over River Valley, we've managed to get two copies of something in our sample. So obviously that suggests the groups are actually pretty small, right? And we can also talk about this in kind of much more qualitative fashions. So I'm done with the graphs, and I'll go back to the pretty pictures here. <laughs> so this, believe it or not, is an archaeological feature. I imagine you're probably looking at it, and well, it just looks like a pile of rocks to me, because it is just a pile of rocks. But this is as close as you get to communal architecture, public architecture in Eastern Sonora. So this is actually a platform. Imagine many people in here have probably been to places like Mesa Grande and Pueblo Grande, these huge Hoacom platform mounds. Some of those are almost as big as a football field. This is about as big as it gets down in Eastern Sonora. It's about 10 meters by about 5 meters and about a high. Right? This is as big as those kind of public architecture spaces get. So obviously, you're not trying to integrate a very large group of people with something that's this big, right? There's just not a lot of effort to pick into kind of big communal spaces. You're probably not trying to make really big groups in this region. Here's one other example where they kind of went and modified what was actually a natural hill. You can see the kind of stack rocks up along the side. And again, it's about 10 meters by about five meters, maybe a little bit bigger in this case, but they were working with the natural landscape and they just kind of modified it a bit, right? So we just don't see a whole lot of investment in those kinds of things that people usually do when they're trying to bring together a big group of people. They're not building big church-like structures. They're not building big courthouse-like structures. Right? You just don't have that kind of investment. So keep in mind, just for comparison, this is what's going on all around, right? You know, over there in eastern Sonora, sorry, yeah, eastern, western Sonora. They're 
over there at Westminster Norm, at your chairs. You know, we got thousands and thousands of mad hours going in the terrace in this huge hill. And you also get big public architecture. You have this kind of big structure down here, the kind of amphitheater portion of the site, where everybody can see what's going on, probably a dance platform or something. And then if you believe Brandon McGuire and some of his work, you also have special stuff up here on the summit. It's probably a elite control, right? So you have investment in these kind of things. We go with Packy Main, you get all kinds of stuff. Dozens of mounds, ball courts, walk-in wells, a lot of investment going in, the different ways to bring large groups of people together. You just simply do not see that really anywhere in Eastern Sonora. So that kind of pulls apart that old model of saying that Eastern Sonora should be kind of even more elaborate than what's going on in the rest of Northwest Mexico and the U.S. Southwest. It just doesn't actually look to be true. All right? So, to kind of take a quick summary of where we're at here, right? So the distribution, the villages, the size of the public architecture, the size of the ritual architecture, all of these things suggest that, in fact, groups on this landscape, not only are they not bigger than what's going on all around, they actually look to be really small. Quite small, right? Not very many people are coming together to form large groups. So it doesn't mean there's not a lot of people on the landscape, it just means they're all separated into these little local independent groups, right? You're not making big, huge political groups, right? Everybody seems to be pretty independent, and it seems to be fractured pretty much along the lines of that landscape. Each little river valley has its own little system, and based on the distribution of people, it doesn't look like there's a whole lot of integration between them, okay? So where are we going next? All right, so now we're going to look at these two groups that I found in Rio and Zuma, and we're going to try and answer the basic question of, well, how different are they really, right? Are they just kind of similar copies of the same group of people, or do they actually try and stand out from each other? Are they actually trying to signal to each other that, no, no, we are not like you. We are our own people. You're your own people over there, and we're going to do all kinds of different things with our material culture to kind of say that we're different from you. How clear are these differences, okay? So mostly we're going to answer this by looking at some of that material culture, looking at some of the patterns. What does the look like? What's the raw art look like? Right? But we'll also look at things like who was exchanging what with who, right? Who was regularly interacting economically with who, right? So we'll start with what is always the most popular, the raw art, right? So unfortunately, you only get really good rocks for doing the raw art in one part of the river valley, right? So down in the south, this is what it looks like. You get a lot of nice basalt down here, so you get a lot of nice rock art. A couple of interesting patterns here. This is kind of all over the side. Um, up here in the US Southwest, you tend to get a whole lot of quadruped types, you know, the, the animals. You only get a handful of these down in the Rio Montezuma, right? And this is a pattern that other people will notice too. For whatever reason, they stay away from the animals. But you get a lot of these kind of like anthropomorph type figures, okay? Interestingly, you don't get much of this once you go kind of north of the Elmo Gap, right? This is a pattern that you see down in the south. In the north, oops, went the wrong way there. You don't get a lot of good rocks. Sorry, this picture's a little bit grainy. The camera was not working great that day. But instead, what we get up here more often is pictoglyphs, and you can see this is a very different style. You kind of get these kind of stickman type figures up there. There are a couple places where they do do the, uh, the petroglyphs where they peck it into the rock. Um, they don't really show up very well at all in the picture because it's, uh, it's kind of a soft and light colored rock, but it also looks quite different from the stuff down in the south, right? So rock art, generally we think this is pretty important stuff. This is kind of ideological information people are drawing on the walls. It's not just graffiti, right? So the fact that this stuff looks different is probably pretty meaningful, but unfortunately it's hard to say much more about it. As I mentioned most of you know, rock art's really hard to day. It's kind of really a lot of interpretive latitude there. Just one other one, mainly for fun, so the sites and ranchers told me about up in the mountains. You can see you got a totally different style here. This doesn't look like either of those two other things I showed you. My best guess is that some of this stuff up here, there's actually only really one site that looks like this. I think it's probably pretty late. Maybe it's patchy. That's really just kind of a guess, to be honest with you. It's pretty neat stuff. Okay. Going back to the kind of more standard line that I meant to use, we can look at the ceramics. Well, I mentioned to you that um, you know these sites, they mainly all been trampled pretty severely by cattle. So unfortunately, I don't have any really nice old pots to show you. This is kind of what I got. You know, all the shirts, they've all been stepped on by a cow at least five or six times, so they all tend to be pretty small. But even so, we can look at these, and we can see there's obviously some pretty different patterns going on here in terms of how people are decorating their ceramics, okay? 
And again, this patterns out really nicely on the landscape geographically. So in the north, pretty much all of your paint ceramics only look like this stuff here, which just kicks up kind of college wall, and I'll explain why that is here in a moment. In the southern part of the research area, down in the Ono Valley, you get kind of two kinds. You get this stuff here, right? And then you get this stuff here. Now this stuff over here, on the far side of the screen, it's got a white background and then black and red line. Well, that's a, that's a pattern that we generally see going on at the same time over there in Chihuahua. So that's why I've called this Chihuahua. But really and truly, they're kind of their own unique thing. But they're very clearly kind of taking some artistic inspiration from over there in Chihuahua. Right? The same thing could probably be said in this stuff here, although it doesn't have a white background. Right? This stuff is probably inspired by stuff that's going on more kind of central to Chihuahua. Okay? This stuff down here obviously looks quite different. Again, no white background. It's usually got a red or a purple or a brownish something that's going to be based on this mineral called hematite. And we don't have a whole lot of it, so it's hard to interpret it, but it obviously looks quite different from this other stuff. And it's quite interesting that for the most part, it only shows up down in the south. Okay? So this stuff here, I think, is probably coming from even further south in Sonora. None of these things are produced at a frequency that suggests a whole lot of local manufacturing. All of these things are probably imported and painted ceramics. But this pattern certainly suggests that these different groups kind of have different exterior connections, right? So maybe these folks are trading kind of over there to Chihuahua, and these folks down here are trading more to the south or maybe over the center of Chihuahua. I show some of these pictures, or I've showed this picture to some other folks, some other archaeologists, and they look at this stuff and they say, well, that's not actually Chihuahua. That actually looks more closely to what's going on in the real Grand. So I can't really tell you. The pieces just aren't that big. But some of this stuff may actually be inspired by what's going on in the Rio Grande at the same time, and not so much what's going on over there in Chihuahua. Now, one very interesting thing, even though I think that they're drawing some artistic inspiration from what's going on over there in Chihuahua, we don't see anything that looks like this, right? So here we have a nice, pretty jar from Packing A, and you have some nice Mesoamerican inspired deities painted on it. You don't get any of that stuff. Right? So these people, they borrowed a lot of the basic artistic tenets, but they left off all the religious content. You don't get any depictions like that on any of the shirts over in Sonora. So maybe they were borrowing some of the artistic ideas from over there in Chihuahua, but they wanted nothing to do with all that fancy Mesoamerican religious stuff people were painting on the pots. In general, we don't get a whole lot of paintings from this. This is what we usually get. And again, you can see these have all been stepped on by a cow three or four times. So, but you see there's a lot of diversity here, right? So they do these kind of simple designs by just kind of pressing different things into the wet clay. And it's a complete mess of trying to sort this stuff out because it's just so diverse, like just tons and tons of diversity. You basically get every possible design style showing up in every kind of corner of Sonora. But if you look at the frequencies, there are some patterns, right? So if we kind of look at each river valley independently, we can say things like, well, we get a lot more incising in the Montezuma Valley. We get a lot more corrugation over here in Chihuahua. This is what they've really shown for about. What they've done there is they've just kind of taken a bunch of fibers and they've kind of rubbed it on the pot just haphazardly. You get that in a couple of different valleys. And then you get this really kind of nice stamped stuff that tends to occur most commonly up here in kind of northern Sonora. It pops up in other places too. So again, we have something that suggests kind of each one of these river valleys is kind of doing its own thing, right? but certainly interacting with some extent. All right. Another very clear pattern are the projectile points, right? So in general, projectile point distributions are never this clear, right? You always get some kind of overlap and it's a real messy pattern. In this case, I don't know if I just got really lucky or if the pattern really is just clear, but in the northern part of the project area, we only get this style here. You get these nice triangular points. We didn't find any of those in the south. The south we get these kind of, um, kind of more diverse, but for the most part, usually stem projectile points, and we didn't get any of those in the north, right? So that's pretty neat, right? These different groups live right next to each other. These two sides are only 30 kilometers apart. You can walk that in a day, and they're not making the projectile points any overlap at all. So, those ethnohistoric documents, they do talk a lot about the prevalence of warfare in this region. And there are some people who even kind of inferred from some different statements that were made that stone projectile points were mostly used in warfare and they wood points for hunting. I don't know how much weight to, to apply to those statements, but it's certainly something that people have noted 
before. So you can imagine that when you do have kind of local warfare groups, you might choose the instruments that you're using in that warfare as something to select out the kind of code of your identity into. You might quite intentionally be making your weapons look a little bit different from all those groups around you, which is not to say that those groups were necessarily hostile towards each other, but almost certainly they wanted to kind of say, we are different from those folks over there, right? We make these things different from those people over there because we are a different group of people, okay? So that pretty much sums up the kind of just basic material pattern comparisons we're gonna do. We can also say something about actual evidence of interaction, right? So there's a variety of different um, techniques that archaeologists use to figure out different kinds of materials were actually procured on the landscape, right? And this usually involves some kind of application of uh, chemistry methods, right? So the most well-known is obsidian glass. Right? This is glass made by volcanoes. Every volcano has very unique chemical signatures. So when we find this obsidian glass, which is used to make things like projectile points, we can usually pinpoint it back to exactly which volcano it came from, right? Well, when we went and did our initial survey, we noticed a really interesting pattern that for the most part, you only got obsidian in the northern part of this river valley. You didn't really get any obsidian down in the south at all. Now, after we did excavation, we basically confirmed this. That side of Taylor Deva had hundreds and hundreds of pieces of obsidian. We didn't even bother to pick it all up. It was just everywhere. After doing even more excavation than we did Taylor and Deva at these other two sites, we had a total of 12 obsidian pieces. So for the most part, this stuff just did not move south. Now we can figure out where most of this stuff came from, all right? It pretty much all comes from this one source called Selene, which is just one river valley over. So, pretty clearly, those folks in the north, they were probably friends with those folks over by that Selene source. They got their hands on this obsidian, and once they got it, they did not trade it south. They kept it, right? Now, generally archaeologists, certainly not always, but we often look at something like obsidian and we say, well, that's something probably those elite folks control, the upper echelon of society, you know, this is fancy stuff, they have to go far away to get it. They are probably the ones who control this stuff. And so what this pattern is really telling us is that those elite folks probably didn't really interact with each other, right? Those northern elite folks didn't interact with those southern elite folks. At least that's our best guess. I'll kind of climb it out on a limb there, but you'll let me get away with it for now. So keep in mind we've also trying to test this overall idea, right? That this is a big corridor for fancy stuff moving between Mesoamerica and the US Southwest. So another durable good that's kind of always comes up in these discussions is marine shell. And there's good reasons for that, right? So Trincheras, which would be located right around here, thousands and thousands and thousands of pieces of marine shell. Not surprising, it's not that far away from the coast, right? It's always been a big question, how do they play into the kind of exchange of marine shell in broader region? If you go up to a place like Paki Man, which would be around here, they had four million pieces from marine shell at that one site, right? It's really far away from the coast. How in the world did they get it, right? So kind of a classic explanation has always been, well, it's probably moving up these nice, convenient, north south river valleys and then being dropped off over there in Packing Bay. Well, here we are on a nice north south trending river valley. And the entire project, I found a whopping 19 pieces of shell, right? So very clearly, this area, at least this one river valley, is not on these trade routes. Again, John Carpenter will be here to talk to you in a couple of months. He's going to tell you a totally different story. But that's <laughs> fine. Um, we can also source some of this stuff. Um, not as precisely as we can with that obsidian, but again, we always kind of thought it should be moving up to Jura Valleys. Instead, it looks like it's moving straight across the desert. That's much more the pattern that we get if people were just kind of handing this stuff off one to the other small increments as opposed to kind of having a set up economic system where you have kind of regular delivery routes, right? So it looks kind of like a much more erratic pattern, okay? And just one more example along these lines, turquoise. Turquoise was always that thing that when people were pinned down on, like, well, what does Mesoamerica get out of this interaction? Archaeologists would usually say, well, they're probably sending turquoise to the south, right? There are some new chemistry methods that have gone out and have characterized particular signatures of turquoise, basically all the U.S. side copper mines, right? So we know what turquoise looks like, chemically speaking, on the U.S. side of the border, right? Well, on my project, much like a shell, I found a whopping three pieces of turquoise. So again, it doesn't look like we're on any kind of major exchange route here. Um, I did this new kind of chemical method, just one of these pieces, and it doesn't match any of those U.S. sources. 
And so again, it doesn't look like that U.S. stuff is kind of flowing down these sort of valleys. Instead, it almost certainly came from some local deposit, which hasn't been characterized thus far. So all of this kind of really tears down that model of kind of elites controlling all these fancy goods moving north and south through these sort of valleys. We just don't see any evidence for the kinds of things that elites being interested in actually moving around. Okay. Whoops. All right. There we go. Um, that is not to say that we don't see any evidence of exchange at all. We change gears here a bit after having just told you for 45 minutes here that there's no evidence whatsoever of interaction between these groups. I'm not going to tell you that that's absolutely not the case when it comes to the kind of mundane plain things. If we look at plain brownware ceramics, stuff that everybody has a couple of in every single household, we actually see evidence that these things are flowing pretty easily across this 30 kilometer or so valley. Again, we do this with some basic geology. Very conveniently, down here next to that side of Elmer Dow, there's a big granitic mountain. It's the only mountain in this area that's made out of granite. So when granite shows up in the pots, usually it kind of mixed in with the clay that people used to make the pots, it's a pretty good bet that it got made somewhere down here around El Bucat. Okay, and then we kind of slice the pots really thin, and we pin them underneath a the microscope, and we can actually count up the different kinds of rocks that are in there. The basic story is when we see granite in the pot, we know it came from down here, right? So then we compare that to where does that pot actually wind up being found in the archaeological record. Well, not surprisingly, down here around Hill Gal, pretty much every single pot has granite in it. Surprisingly, up around Hill and Depa, nowhere near any granite, 25% of your pots still have granite in there. So very clearly, those folks up in Tail and Depa, even though they don't appear to be interacted with Hill and Gal in any other way, they're getting a lot of their pots from them. Keep in mind, we don't have any idea if they actually care about the pots, or what's actually in the pots. And there are actually some hints that maybe there's some other kinds of exchanges and some very mundane goods that are also going on alongside this that are much harder to see archaeologically, right? So we go to El Nogal, again, we're in the south end of the project zone here. You get just tons and tons of ground stuff, big, huge matatis, the biggest matatis I've ever seen. Some of them are like this big. Now, these are not being made to be transported someplace else. A lot of them are really deeply worn. A lot of them have really big vesicles, meaning the little pore spaces can be that big. It's too big to even grind corn in, so I don't even really know what they're doing with these things. But they really love them. There are 200 some odd of these matates just laying on the surface, right? The next biggest site, Tail and Depa, I think I found 12, right? So a very categorically different kind of production going on. I don't really know how to explain this, but it's quite possible that they were making things at El Nogal, which were then being exported to other places perhaps Taylor Depot. We also get special things like agave knives and El Gal, which we didn't see at any other place on the survey or the excavation. Turn that around with the Taylor Depot. You get unique lithic tools up there that we don't find in the other place. So you get nice by facial knives. These are things made out of chert. Keep in mind, we're only talking about 30 kilometers here. So these people have access to the same raw materials. They have access to the same ecological conditions. There's no real explanation for why these places she looks so different and luster is doing some kind of different specialization in terms of subsistence and maybe they're trading food back and forth. But that for the most part is just a guess. Okay? Alright, so let's kind of take a break here and sum everything up, okay? So in terms of those material culture patterns, in terms of those exchange interactions that we can recreate, we can look at the north area and we can say, oh, okay, well those guys are getting obsidian from over there. Those white rare ceramics are coming from somewhere in that general direction. Maybe it's Rio Grande, maybe it's over in Chihuahua, maybe it's somewhere in between that we haven't actually found. We look at the southern end, and it looks like they're probably getting those kind of red on brown ceramics, probably coming up from the south. Get some of those other kind of black and red on brown. Their technical name is Gabigra ceramics, which are probably coming from somewhere over in central Chihuahua. Once these things wind up there, there's not a whole lot of interaction. It doesn't look like fancy stuff moves around. But it does look like the mundane stuff moves around. So how are we going to explain this difference? Why does the fancy stuff not move? Or why does the really mundane stuff apparently move pretty easily? Well, I'm going to climb a bit out on a limb here. My best guess at the moment is that we should take some of those interpretations about this area being really rife with internecine warfare and face value. And you can imagine a situation in which you kind of have your local elite who's basically going out there and he's constantly getting your community in trouble. He's out there picking fights with other folks. You're going on to hedge your bets, right? You're going to make friends in other groups. So just in case your community kind of suffers some kind of political downfall, some kind of political turmoil, 
you've got other friends you can call, right? So that's what I think is going on here in terms of why we see these very different exchange patterns depending on whether or not it's a mundane good or whether or not it's a leak good, right? It's commoners, they kind of want to have friends spread around so they can have someone to call on just in case things get really ugly, okay? But that's kind of the local explanation. Let's bring it back to this big question. What does all of this mean in terms of interpreting Eastern Sonora as a corridor of interaction between the U.S. Southwest and Mesoamerica? Okay? So keep in mind, this is just kind of a refresher memory. I think I actually got things slightly out of order here, so I'm going to skip over the next slide and come back. But this is the old one, right? You got Eastern Sonora dominated by just two or three big groups. It's going to be really easy to move things through this region because all of these folks are going to be really invested in the system and you have these nice, convenient north-south river valleys and you know, things like macaws and turquoise and things are just going to be able to hop, skip and jump back and forth between them, right? So here's just an example of one of these previous interpretations. So this was a model to explain the movement of turquoise. And you can see it just had a nice thoroughfare and sipping right up and down eastern Sonora there, right? Well, that works. This is how Eastern Sonora looks, right? Because you only got two or three middlemen you got to deal with. But this is what Eastern Sonora probably actually looks like, right? So, the ones that are bolded here, those polygons are places where we've actually gone out and done at least a handful of research to say something about what this looks like. Well, at most, this is how big the communities are. The rest of this I'm just kind of making up based on kind of what we found in these other places. But instead of having just like, you know, four or five groups here in Eastern Sonora, you probably got like 40, 50 groups, all independent. Some of them cooperate with other ones. Some of them want nothing to do with their neighbors. It's going to be really hard to move anything through this region, either materially or even ideas, right? And that's probably why we don't see much evidence of this kind of interaction in Eastern Sonora. So I'll go ahead and wrap it up here. Basically, just said a lot of this stuff. Looks like the groups are really small, right? Pretty strong evidence that for the most part, just the distribution of the mountains, the valleys, where the good farmland is, explains why most of those groups are where they are and why most of those boundaries are where they are. But overall, it gives rise to this quite balkanized landscape that is kind of even more so balkanized than any of the other regions in the Southwest, which presumably previously thought, you know, those were kind of lesser compared to Eastern Sonora, but that's absolutely not the case. Now, just as kind of a, a thing for the future here, it is worth asking, well, why in 1500, if this was such a fractious, balkanized, boring landscape, why were there still so many people living here in 1500 after Casas Grandes and Hohokam and Chincheras had all fallen apart? And I think there's probably an important lesson here, that even though you had kind of a very contentious landscape, probably the small scale of organization may have kind of been able to survive some of those kind of big disturbing events that kind of really shook those highly integrated polities. But that's just a guess. That's why I hope to go back there and do more research. So I will just wrap this up by saying thank you one more time. This was a good friend of mine down there who always insisted that we ride horses because he didn't feel like a proper human being should walk around in the bush. It was really difficult to actually do survey work, so we worked out this deal where we would ride horses every other day, and then I would tie up the horse and get off and actually do the survey, and he would kind of go and move off and try and rope cattle to keep his skills up. So thank you to him, and thank you to all of you for coming out tonight. And uh, hopefully we have at least a little bit of time for some questions. So all the best. talking about state lights. Yeah. Um, I'm not a real big fan of, you know, sticking some kind of title on a settlement pattern and stuff like that, but could you just talk a little bit about, when I, when I looked at the architecture and a variety of these other things, um, some people might think of kind of a chieftain level society in terms of, you know, very small monumental architecture, not really substantial, you know, housing, a variety of, other sorts of things like that. And I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about the term state lit. And how yeah, yeah, sure. So uh, first I should just back up and kind of uh, emphasize that the individual that came up with that term 
that was kind of before most of the archaeology was done. So he was, that was entirely based off the other historic record. So he wasn't like crazy to say those things, because you can sure. get that impression from reading sure. those Adam Petries. And I should also point out that he originally proposed that term, I think, in 1979, which would have been kind of at the sweet spot of the time period when like, you know, ascribing a label like chiefdom and state oh, yeah. and stuff sure. was like oh. totally the norm, right? So I shouldn't pick on him too much for using terms like that because that was, that was kind of what people did back then. Um, but I think you're absolutely right. You know, we, we generally now realize that's not super useful of a, of a way to go about it. But more or less, and he actually spoke to this pretty specifically a couple of times, he said he avoided calling him the chiefdom because he thought the term chiefdom was too loaded. But that obviously kind of backfired using the term like statehood, which obviously implies kind of even something a little bit more than the chiefdom. Um, that probably was not actually his intent. That's certainly kind of how archaeologists eventually kind of took it to me. Right? So there's certainly been some kind of you know, post-original suggested interpretation that are probably not really fair to ascribe to him. But chiefdom is more or less what he meant. I think we can fairly say. Yeah, well, I'm just saying in general terms, you know, my dissertation worked at Honduras and the mm -hmm. Nunca Valley. It had a lot of these similar kinds of elements in terms of primate centers, yeah. smaller sites. Yeah, the, so I, I think he definitely expected that we would find really nice communal architecture out there, that ball courts would be kind of prolific and everywhere, and that maybe you'd even get the occasional pyramid. Didn't pan out. Yeah. Didn't didn't work out that way. But yeah, he was definitely kind of envisioning something a little bit more than a chiefdom. But it actually looks to be something a fair bit less than a chiefdom. Yes. How were you and your friend there and others accepted by the private landowners? Well, well, he was a local folk. So I mean, that's what you do. You go down there and you make friends with a couple people, and um, they kind of grease the wheels to get you in. A lot of the land down here is in what's called the Ajito system. So it's somewhat communally owned. And so you can kind of go to one person or one kind of authority and he can kind of grant you access to the whole thing. And even in areas that are not necessarily Hito, there's still kind of this recent memory of kind of a more communal ownership of land. So people tend to be much more open to granting land access. They don't see it as something that's really an infringement as long as you kind of ask permission. They're generally pretty happy, pretty happy to grant it. So I always had a lot of easy luck in that regard. Yeah, Paul. Um, there's a whole lot, not much data on this, but just speculate. When, how far south do you go when this pattern of very small organization um, gives out and you get larger, more highly integrated? I would say kind of halfway through Sinaloa. Like Guadabampo stuff? Or? Yeah, I think Guadabampo is probably at pretty much the same scale, honestly. I mean, that's obviously it's going to be maritime and have some different economic stuff going on there. But I would definitely think that it, it goes basically up to the frontier of what people call as to land, whatever in the world that is, that's probably where you get kind of a switch over. But even that's kind of debatable, yeah. In your presentation, it sounded like you mostly did sort of superficial walking surveys, not a lot of deep excavations. Any evidence of irrigation? So almost certainly out there on those river flood plains, that would be where you would do river uh, irrigation. The, the structure of the landscape makes it that it's just pretty much impossible to get the river up onto the first terrace. There's just always a really steep drop there. So you kind of are always constrained to this really kind of narrow river valley. And to answer that question, would you really have to go out there with backhoes and do trenches to kind of like find these profiles? And that's something that the Mexican government is not generally happy to grant permission to do. But we can say with pretty good certainty that they have irrigation out there on those river flood plains. But because it's so constrained in terms of its um, geographic scale, it was probably nothing like what we're used to seeing up here in the Hocom region, where you just build these kilometer long canals the way up onto Bajadas and First Terraces. You're just not going to be able to do that there. And so it's going to be a pretty simple system just because the area you're trying to irrigate is going to be pretty small. But certainly those things are out there. We just had proven it. So supporting very small populations. Uh, well, probably dense populations in it, these spots, but at the kind of landscape, the regional level, probably 100,000 is probably an overestimate. But I, for the most part, avoid that question because we just haven't done enough research there to kind of answer that. Yeah. Mm. Do you think there were much larger populations on the coastal plain? Um, no, I, I think there were probably larger cost populations here, like overall. Because you can have a lot of people in these river valleys. I mean, I don't want to imply that there weren't a lot of people. You know, it's kind of this um, you know, question of like demographic pressure does not always equal complexity. So I think there are probably a lot of people here. I think they were just in individually small groups localized to these river valleys. But the coastal plain is pretty sparse. Um, it's hard to imagine how you could pack too many people 
out in that location. I mean, a lot of those people were hunters and gatherers, so. Yes? Um, did you find any variants or evidence of, of uh, households, individual households? Um, well, certainly you find the architecture. It's right there on the surface. I mean, you can kind of map these things out and say, okay, you know, here's a structure, here's a structure, here's a structure. Um, they don't have, or at least we don't have, the patterns established like we do here in the Ho'okam, where we kind of understand, we'll say in the pre-classic, that okay, you're going to get like four households, and they're all going to face each other. You know, we can see that there are structures there. We don't really totally understand how they relate to each other, other than that they're at the same site, right? We just haven't done enough archaeology to really answer that question. In terms of the burials, um, I didn't find any burials. They found a couple over in some different spots and different projects. Um, from talking to local ranchers, it seems that the most common burial pattern in this region was cremation, and that it was usually buried off sites in these uh, geographic locations. They're called bahios, so it's off down the, off the mesa, kind of in these kind of low wash areas where things were people were usually interred, and people generally haven't done archaeology there, so the burial population is really quite low. Which is, again, it's it's a good question. We just haven't done enough archaeology to answer it. Yes. Seems pretty clear from the Coronado era records that uh, Marcus Denisa saw talked to people in central Sonora who had been back and forth mm -hmm. in Cibola. And then when Coronado came through the next year, they went up the Rio Sonora Valley. That seemed to be the main avenue. So based on that, would, would you be inclined to say that the Montezuma Valley was maybe off the main route and there may have been more of a main route in the Rio Yeah, I mean, that's certainly one interpretation. Maybe I just picked the one river valley that nobody wanted to go to, right? I mean, that <laughs> can certainly be the case. Um, you know, uh, again, you know, we, we talk about what we can see archaeologically. That doesn't mean that people never interacted, right? Certainly people were moving around, and, you know, I kind of hold with Steve Lexon that you should probably generally assume that people always kind of knew what was going on all around them. So I'm sure people were moving around. And if I got into really the details of this, I think if you look at some of those, um, Texture designs, the fact that those tend to always appear at some low frequency probably is indication of kind of pretty frequent kind of household level migration, but you don't have regular established kind of interaction patterns. I think it's just kind of sporadic, but certainly I think people will move around. You should definitely come back when a, a, a John Carpenter gives this talk because he's going to try and tell you that they didn't go up the real snore at all, they're over in the real Bibi's Bay, but we just kind of don't talk about that. So. <laughs> they use place names when they're I, they do, but um, it is kind of, and like, this is not my fault, so like, you're right, you know, but um, uh, there's an argument that many of those place names were actually kind of described by Jesuit people who came 100 years later who were also reading the same documents and said, oh, we must be in this place, so that's what we'll call it, even though they may have been in a totally different value lead from what was originally described. But again, that's, I, I stay away from the Coronado debate because I don't know, you know. So. <laughs> Anybody else? All right. Well, thank you all again.